Let's imagine for a moment we had the option to redesign human civilization from the ground up. What if, hypothetically speaking, we discovered an exact replica of the planet Earth, and the only difference between this new planet and our current one is that human evolution had not occurred. It was an open palette. No countries, no cities, no pollution, no republicans. Just a pristine, open environment. So, what would we do? Well, first we need a goal, right? And it's safe to say that goal would be to survive. And not to just survive, but to do so in an optimized, healthy, prosperous way. Most people indeed desire to live, and they would prefer to do so without suffering. Therefore, the basis of this civilization needs to be as supportive and hence sustainable for human life as possible. Taking into account the material needs of all the world's people, while trying to remove anything that could hurt us in the long run. That goal of, say, maximum sustainability understood, the next question regards our method. What kind of approach do we take? Well, let's see. Last I checked, politics was the method of social operation on Earth. So what do the doctrines of the Republicans, liberals, conservatives, or socialists have to say about societal design? Hmm, not a damn thing. Okay then, what about religion? Surely the great creator had to have left some blueprint somewhere. No, nothing I can find. Okay then, so what's left? It appears something called science. Science is unique in that its methods demand not only that the ideas proposed be tested and replicated, but everything science comes up with is also inherently falsifiable. In other words, unlike religion and politics, science has no ego, and everything it suggests accepts the possibility of being proven wrong eventually. It holds on to nothing and evolves constantly. Well, that sounds natural enough to me. So then, Based on the current state of scientific knowledge in the early 21st century, along with our goal of maximum sustainability for the human population, how do we begin the actual process of construction? Well, the first question to ask, what do we need to survive? The answer, of course, are planetary resources. Whether it is the water we drink, the energy we use, the raw materials we utilize to create tools and shelter, the planet hosts an inventory of resources, many of which are demanded for our survival. So, given that reality, it then becomes critical to figure out what we have and where it is. This means we need to conduct a survey. We simply locate and identify every physical resource on the planet we can, along with the amount available at each location, from the deposits of copper, to the most potent locations for wind farms to produce energy, to the natural freshwater springs, to an assessment of the amount of fish in the ocean, to the most prime arable land for food cultivation, etc. But, since we humans are going to be consuming these resources over time, we then realize that not only do we need to locate and identify, we also need to track. We need to make sure we don't run out of any of this stuff. That would be bad. And this means not only tracking our rates of use, but the rates of earthly regeneration as well, such as how long it takes for, say, a tree to grow or a spring to replenish. This is called dynamic equilibrium. In other words, if we use up trees faster than they can be grown back, we have a serious problem, for it is unsustainable. So then, how do we track this inventory, especially when we recognize that all of this stuff is scattered everywhere? We have large mineral mines in what we call Africa, energy concentrations in the Middle East, huge tidal power possibilities on the Atlantic coast of North America, the largest supply of fresh water in Brazil, etc. Well, once again, good old science has a suggestion. It's called systems theory. Systems theory recognizes that the fabric of the natural world, from human biology, to the earthly biosphere, to the gravitational pull of the solar system itself, is one huge, synergistically connected system, fully interlinked. Just as human cells connect to form our organs, and the organs connect to form our bodies, and since our bodies cannot live without the earthly resources of food, air, and water, we are intrinsically connected to the earth, and so on. So, as nature suggests, we take all of this inventory and tracking data and create a system to manage it. 
a global resource management system, in fact, to account for every relevant resource on the planet. There is simply no logical alternative if our goal as a species is survival in the long run. We have to keep track as a whole. That understood, we can now consider production. How do we use all this stuff? What will our process of production be, and what do we need to consider to make sure it is as optimized as possible to maximize our sustainability? Well, the first thing that jumps right out at us is the fact that we need to constantly try and preserve. The planet's resources are essentially finite, so it is important that we be strategic. Strategic preservation is key. The second thing we recognize is that some resources are really not as good as others in their performance. In fact, some of this stuff, when put into use, has a terrible effect on the environment, which invariably hinders our own health. For example, oil and fossil fuels, no matter how you cut it, release some pretty destructive agents into the environment. Therefore, it is critical we do our best to use such things only when we really have to, if at all. Fortunately for us, we see a ton of solar, wind, tidal, wave, heat differential, and geothermal possibilities for energy production. So we can strategize objectively about what we use and where to avoid what could be called negative retroactions, or anything that results from production or use that damages the environment and hence ourselves. We will call this strategic safety to couple in with our strategic preservation. But production strategies do not stop there. We are going to need an efficiency strategy for the actual mechanics of production itself. And what we find is that there are roughly three specific protocols we must adhere to. One, every good we produce must be designed to last as long as possible. Naturally, the more things break down, the more resources we are going to need to replace them, and the more waste produced. Two, when things do break down or are no longer usable for whatever reason, it is critical that we harvest or recycle as much as we possibly can. So the production design must take this into account directly at the very earliest stages. Three, quickly evolving technologies such as electronics, which are subject to the fastest rates of technological obsolescence, would need to be designed to foreshadow and accommodate physical updates. The last thing we want to do is throw away an entire computer system just because it has only one broken part or is outdated. So we simply design the components to be easily updated, part by part, standardized and universally interchangeable, foreshadowed by the current trend of technological change. And when we realize that the mechanisms of strategic preservation, strategic safety, and strategic efficiency are purely technical considerations, devoid of any human opinion or bias. We simply program these strategies into a computer which can weigh and calculate all the relevant variables, allowing us to always arrive at the absolute best method for sustainable production based on current understandings. And while that might sound complex, all it is is a glorified calculator. Not to mention such multivariate decision-making and monitoring systems are already used across the world today for isolated purposes. It is simply a process of scaling it out. So, now we not only have our resource management system, but also a production management system, both of which are easily computer automated to maximize efficiency, preservation, and safety. The informational reality is that the human mind, or even a group of humans, cannot track what needs to be tracked. It must be done by computers, and it can be. And this brings us to the next level, distribution. What sustainability strategies make sense here? Well, since we know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and since energy is required to power transport machines, the less transport distance, the more efficient. Producing goods in one continent and shipping them over to another only makes sense if the goods in question simply cannot be produced in the target area. Otherwise, it is nothing but wasteful. We must localize production, so distribution is simple, fast, and requires the least amount of energy. We'll call this the proximity strategy. 
which simply means we reduce the travel of goods as much as possible, whether raw materials or finished consumer products. Of course, it might also be important to know what goods we are transporting and why, and this falls under the category of demand. And demand is simply what people need to be healthy and to have a high quality of life. The spectrum of material human needs range from core life-supporting necessities, such as food, clean water, shelter, to social and recreational goods, which allow for relaxation and personal social enjoyment, both important factors in human and social health overall. So, very simply, we take another survey. People describe their needs. Demand is assessed, and production begins based on that demand. And since the level of demand of different goods will naturally fluctuate and change around different regions, we need to create a demand distribution tracking system, so to avoid overruns and shortages. Of course, this idea is old news. It is used in every major store chain today to make sure they keep up with their inventory. Only this time we are tracking on a global scale. But, wait a minute, we really can't fully understand demand if we don't account for the actual usage of the good itself. Is it logical and sustainable for every single human to, say, have one of everything made regardless of their usage? No, that would be simply wasteful and inefficient. If a person has a need for a good, but that need is only for, say, 45 minutes a day on average, it would be much more efficient if that good was made available to them and to others when needed. Many forget that it isn't the good that they want, it is the purpose of that good. When we realize that the good itself is only as important as its utility, we see that external restriction, or what we might call today ownership, is extremely wasteful and environmentally illogical in a fundamental economic sense. So, we need to devise a strategy called strategic access. This will be the foundation of our demand distribution tracking system, which makes sure we can meet the demand of the population's needs for access of whatever they need, when they need it. And as far as physically obtaining the goods, Centralized and regional access centers all make sense for the most part. Placed in close proximity to the population, and a person would simply come in, take the item, use it, and when finished, return it when it is no longer needed. Sort of how a library works today. In fact, these centers could not only exist in the community in the way we see local stores today, but specialized access centers would exist in specific areas where often certain goods are utilized saving more energy with less repeat transport. And once this demand tracking system is in order, it is tied into our production management system, and of course into our resource management system, hence creating a unified, dynamically updating, global economic management machine that simply makes sure we remain sustainable, starting with securing the integrity of our finite resources, moving to make sure we only create the best, most strategic goods possible, while distributing everything in the most intelligent and efficient way. And the unique result of this preservation-based approach, which is intuitively counter to many, is that this logical, ground-up, empirical process of preservation and efficiency, which can only define true human sustainability on this planet, would likely enable something never before seen in human history. Access abundance. Not just for a percentage of the global population, but the entire civilization. This economic model, as was just generalized, this responsible systems approach to total earth resource management and processes, designed again to do nothing less than take care of humanity as a whole in the most efficient and sustainable way, could be termed a resource-based economy. The idea was defined in the 1970s by structural engineer Jacques Fresco. He understood back then that society was on a collision course with nature and itself, unsustainable on every level. And if things didn't change, we would destroy ourselves one way or another. Are all these things you're saying, Jacques, uh, could they be built with what we know today, or are some of these things are you guessing based on what we know today? No. All of these things can be built with what we know today. 
It would take 10 years to change the surface of the earth, to rebuild the world into a second Garden of Eden. The choice lies with you. The stupidity of a nuclear arms race, the development of weapons, trying to solve your problems politically by electing this political party or that political party, that all politics is immersed in corruption. Let me say it again. Communism, socialism, fascism, the Democrats, the liberals, we want to absorb human beings. All organizations that believe in the better life of man, there are no Negro problems or Polish problems or Jewish problems or Greek problems or women's problems. They're human problems. I'm not afraid of anybody. I don't work for anyone. No one can discharge me. I have no boss. I am afraid to live in the society we live in today. Our society cannot be maintained by this type of incompetency. It was great, the free enterprise system, about 35 years ago. That was the last of its usefulness. Now we've got to change our way of thinking or perish. The horror movies of the future will be our society, the way it didn't work. And politics would be part of a horror movie. Well, lots of people today use the term cold science because they're analytical. And they don't even know what analytical means. Science means closer approximations of the way the world really works. So it's telling the truth is what it is. A scientist doesn't try to get along with people. They tell them what their findings are. They have to question all things. And if some scientist comes up with an experiment that shows certain materials have certain strength, other scientists have to be able to duplicate that experiment and come up with the same results. Even if a scientist feels that an airplane wing, due to mathematics or calculations, can hold up a given amount of weight, they still pile sandbags on it to see when it breaks. And they say, you know, my calculations are right, or they're not correct. I love that system because it's free of bias and free of thinking that math can solve all the problems. You have to put your math to test also. I think that every system that can be put to test should be put to test. And that all decisions should be based upon research. A resource-based economy is simply the scientific method applied to social concern, an approach utterly absent in the world today. Society is a technical invention, and the most efficient methods of optimized human health, physical production, distribution, city infrastructure, and the like reside in the field of science and technology, not politics or monetary economics. It operates in the same systematic way as, say, an airplane, and there is no Republican or liberal way to build an airplane. Likewise, nature itself is the physical referent we use to prove our science, and it is a set system, emerging only from our increased understanding of it. In fact, it has no regard for what you subjectively think or believe to be true. Rather, it gives you an option. You can learn and fall in line with its natural laws and conduct yourself accordingly, invariably creating good health and sustainability, or you can go against the current to no avail. It doesn't matter how much you believe you can just stand up right now and walk on the wall next to you. The law of gravity will not allow it. If you do not eat, you will die. If you are not touched as an infant, you will die. As harsh as it may sound, nature is a dictatorship and we can either listen to it and come in harmony with it or suffer the inevitable adverse consequences. So a resource-based economy is nothing more than a set of proven life-supporting understandings where all decisions are based upon optimized human and environmental sustainability. It takes into account the empirical life ground which every human being shares as a need regardless again of their political or religious philosophy. There is no cultural relativism to this approach. It isn't a matter of opinion. Human needs are human needs, and having access to the necessities of life, such as clean air, nutritious food, and clean water, along with a positively reinforcing, stable, nurturing, and non-violent environment, is demanded for our mental and physical health, our evolutionary fitness, and hence the species' survival itself. A resource-based economy would be based upon available resources. You can't just bring a lot of people to an island or build a city of 50,000 people 
without having access to the necessities of life. So when I use the term a comprehensive systems approach, I'm talking about doing an inventory of the area first and determining what that area can supply, not just architectural approach, not just design approach, but design must be based on all of the requirements to enhance human life. And that's what I mean by an integrated way of thinking. Food, clothing, shelter, warmth, love, all those things are necessary. If you deprive people of any of them, you have a lesser human being, less capable of functioning. As previously outlined, a resource-based economy's ground-up, global, systems approach to extraction, production, and distribution is based upon a set of true economic mechanisms, or strategies, which guarantee efficiency and sustainability in every area of the economy. So, continuing this train of thought regarding logical design, what is next in our equation? Where does all this materialize? Cities. The advent of the city is a defining feature of modern civilization. Its role is to enable efficient access to the necessities of life, along with increased social support and community interaction. So how would we go about designing an ideal city? What shape should we make it? Square? Trapezoid? Well, given we're going to be moving around the thing, we might as well make it as equidistant as possible for ease. Hence, the circle. What should the city contain? Well, naturally we need a residential area, a goods production area, a power generation area, an agricultural area. But we also need nurturing as human beings, hence culture, nature, recreation, and education. So let's include a nice open park, an entertainment events area for cultural purposes and socializing, and educational and research facilities. And since we're working with a circle, it seems rational to place these functions in belts based on the amount of land required for each goal, along with ease of access. Very good. Now, let's get down to specifics. First, we need to consider the core infrastructure, or intestines, of the city organism. These would be the water, good, waste, and energy transport channels. Just as we have water and sewage systems under our cities today, we would extend this channeling concept to integrate waste recycling and delivery itself. No more mailman or garbage men. It is built right in. We could even use automated pneumatic tubes and similar technologies. Same goes for transport. It needs to be integrated and strategically designed to reduce or even remove the need for wasteful, independent automobiles. Electric trams, conveyors, transveyors, and maglevs, which can take you virtually anywhere in the city, even up and down, along with connecting you to other cities as well. And, of course, in the event an automobile is required, it is automated by satellite for safety and integrity. In fact, this automation technology is in working order right now. Automobile accidents kill about 1.2 million people every single year, injuring about 50 million. This is absurd and doesn't have to occur. Between efficient city design and automated driverless cars, this death toll can be virtually eliminated. Agriculture. Today, through our haphazard cost-cutting industrial methods, using pesticides, excessive fertilizers, and other means, we have successfully destroyed much of the arable land on this planet, not to mention also extensively poisoning our bodies. In fact, industrial and agricultural chemical toxins now show up in virtually every human being tested, including infants. Fortunately, there is a glaring alternative the soilless mediums of hydroponics and aeroponics, which also reduce nutrient and water requirements by up to 75% of our current usage. Food can now be organically grown on an industrial scale in enclosed vertical farms, such as in 50-story, one-acre plots, virtually eliminating the need for pesticides and hydrocarbons in general. This is the future of industrial food cultivation, efficient, clean, and abundant. So, such advanced systems would be, in part, what comprise our agricultural belt, producing all the food required for the entire city's population, with no need to import anything from the outside, saving time, waste, and energy. And speaking of energy, the energy belt would work in a systems approach to extract electricity from our abundant renewable mediums, 
specifically wind, solar, geothermal, and heat differentials, and if near water potentials, tidal, and wave power. To avoid intermittency and make sure a positive net energy return occurs, these mediums will operate in an integrated system, powering each other when needed, while storing excessive energy to large supercapacitors under the ground, so nothing can go to waste. And not only does the city power itself, particular structures will also power independently and generate electricity through photovoltaic paints, structural pressure transducers, the thermal couple effect, and other current but underutilized technologies. But of course this begs the question, how does this technology and goods in general get created in the first place? This brings us to production. The industrial belt, apart from having hospitals and the like, would be the hub of factory production. Completely localized overall, it would of course obtain raw materials by way of the global resource management system just discussed, with demand being generated by the population of the city itself. As far as the mechanics of production, we need to discuss a new, powerful phenomenon which was sparked very recently in human history and is on pace to changing everything. It's called mechanization, or the automation of labor. Well, if you look uh, around you, you'll notice that almost everything that we use today uh, is built automatically. Uh, your shoes, your clothes, your home appliances, your car, and so on, uh, they are all built by machines uh, in an automatic way. Can we say that the society has not been influenced by these major technological advancements? Of course not. These uh, systems really dictate new structures and new needs, and they make a lot of other things obsolete. So we've been going up uh, in the development and use of technology in an exponential way. So definitely, Automation is going to continue. You cannot stop the technologies that just make sense. Labor automation through technology is at the bottom of every major social transformation in human history. From the agricultural revolution and the invention of the plow, to the industrial revolution and the invention of the powered machine, to the information age we live in now through essentially the invention of advanced electronics and computers. And with regard to advanced production methods today, Mechanization is now evolving on its own, moving away from the traditional method of assembling component parts into a configuration into an advanced method of creating entire products in one single process. Like most engineers, I'm fascinated by biology because it's so full of examples of extraordinary pieces of engineering. Um, and the, what biology is, is the study of things that copy themselves, of course. Like that good a definition of life as we've got. Again, as an engineer, I've always been intrigued by the idea of machines that would copy themselves. RetRap is a three-dimensional printer. That's to say, it's a printer that you plug into a computer, and instead of making two-dimensional sheets of paper with patterns on, it makes real, physical, three-dimensional objects. Now, there's nothing new about that. Uh, 3D printers have been around for about 30 years. The big thing about RetRap is that it prints most of its own parts so if you've got one, you can make another one and give it to a friend, as well as being able to print lots of useful things. From the simple printing of basic household goods in your home, to the printing of an entire automobile body in one swoop, advanced automated 3D printing now has the potential to transform virtually every field of production, including home construction. The contour crafting is actually a fabrication technology the so-called 3D printing, when you directly build a 3D object from a computer model. Using contour crafting, it will be possible to build a 2,000 square foot home entirely by the machine in one day. The reason that uh, people are interested in automating construction is that it really brings a lot of benefits. Uh, for example, Construction is pretty labor intensive, and uh, although it provides job for uh, the sector of the society, it also has issues uh, and uh, complications. For example, construction is the most dangerous job that there is. 
Uh, it is worse than mining and agriculture. It has got the highest level of fatality almost in every country. Another issue is the waste. Um, an average home in the United States has three to seven tons of waste. So this is huge uh, if we look at the impact of construction and, and knowing that about 40% of all materials in the world are used in construction. So a big waste of uh, energy and resources and big damage to the environment as well. Making homes using hammers and nails and wood with the state of our technology today is really absurd and will go the way of our labor class in regards to manufacturing in the United States. Recently, there was a study by economist David Attor of MIT that states that our middle class is obsolete and being replaced by automation. Quite simply, mechanization is more productive, efficient, and sustainable than human labor in virtually every sector of the economy today. Machines do not need vacations, breaks, insurance, pensions, and they can work 24 hours a day every day. The output potential and accuracy compared to human labor is unmatched. The bottom line, repetitive human labor is becoming obsolete and impractical across the world. And the unemployment you see around you today is fundamentally the result of this evolution of efficiency in technology. For years, market economists have dismissed this growing pattern, which could be called technological unemployment, because of the fact that new sectors always seem to emerge to reabsorb the displaced workers. Today, the service sector is the only real hub left and currently employs over 80% of the American workforce, with most industrialized countries maintaining a similar proportion. However, this sector is now being challenged increasingly by automated kiosks, automated restaurants, and even automated stores. Economists today are finally acknowledging what they have been denying for years. Not only is technological unemployment exasperating the current labor crisis we see across the world due to the global economic downturn, but the more the recession deepens, the faster the industries are mechanizing. The catch, which is not realized, is that the faster they mechanize to save money, the more they displace people, the more they reduce public purchasing power. This means that while the corporation can produce everything more cheaply, fewer and fewer people will actually have money to buy anything, regardless of how cheap they become. The bottom line is that the labor for income game is slowly coming to an end. In fact, if you take a moment to reflect on the jobs which are in existence today, which automation could take over right now if applied, 75% of the global workforce could be replaced by mechanization tomorrow. And this is why, in a resource-based economy, there is no monetary market system. No money at all. For there is no need. A resource-based economy recognizes the efficiency of mechanization and accepts it for what it offers. It doesn't fight it like we do today. Why? Because it is irresponsible not to, given any interest in efficiency and sustainability. And this brings us back to our city system. In the center is the central dome, which not only houses the educational facilities and transportation hub, it also hosts the mainframe that runs the city's technical operations. The city is, in fact, one big automated machine. It has sensors and all technical belts to track the progress of agriculture, energy gathering, production, distribution, and the like. Now, would people be needed to oversee these operations in the event of a malfunction or the like? Most probably yes, but that number would decrease over time as improvements continue. However, as of today, maybe 3% of the city population would be needed for this job when you break it down. And I can assure you, that in an economic system which is actually designed to take care of you and secure your well-being without you having to submit to a private dictatorship on a daily basis usually to a job that is either technically unnecessary or socially pointless while often struggling with debt that doesn't exist just to make ends meet I guarantee you people will volunteer their time left and right to maintain and improve a system that actually takes care of them. 
And coupled with this issue of incentive comes the common assumption that if there isn't some external pressure for one to work for a living, people will just sit around, do nothing, and turn into fat, lazy blobs. This is nonsense. The labor system we have today is in fact the generator of laziness, not a resolver of it. If you think back to when you were a child, full of life, interested in new things to understand, likely creating and exploring, but as time went on, the system pushed you into the focus of figuring out how to make money. And from early education to study at a university, you are narrowed, only to emerge as a creature which serves as a cog in a wheel in a model that sends all the fruits to the upper 1%. Scientific studies have now shown that people are, in fact, not motivated by monetary reward when it comes to ingenuity and creation. The creation itself is the reward. Money, in fact, appears only to serve as an incentive for repetitive, mundane actions, a role we have just now shown can be replaced by machine. So when it comes to innovation, the actual use of the human mind, the monetary incentive has proven to be a hindrance interfering and detracting from creative thought. And this might explain why Nikola Tesla, the Wright brothers, and other inventors who contributed massively to our current world never showed a monetary incentive to do so. Money is, in fact, a false incentive and causes a hundred times more distortion than it does contribution. Good morning, class. Please settle down. The first thing I would like to do is go around the room and ask what everyone would like to be when they grow up. Who would like to go first? Okay, how about you, Sarah? When I grow up, I want to work in McDonald's like my mom. Oh, family tradition, eh? How about you, Linda? When I grow up, I'm going to be a prostitute on the streets of New York City. Oh, glamour girl, huh? Very ambitious. How about you, Tommy? When I grow up, I'm going to be a rich, elitist businessman who works on Wall Street and profits off of the collapse of foreign economies. Enterprising. And great to see some multicultural interest. As stated before, a resource-based economy applies the scientific method to social concern. And this isn't limited to simply technical efficiency. It also has the consideration of human and social well-being directly and what comprises it. What good is a social system if, in the end, it doesn't produce happiness and peaceful coexistence? So it is important to point out that with the removal of the money system and the necessities of life provided, we would see a global reduction in crime by about 95% almost immediately, for there is nothing to steal, embezzle, scam, or the like. 95% of all people in prisons today are there due to some monetary related crime or drug abuse and drug abuse is a disorder not a crime. So what about the other 5% the truly violent often seeming to some as being violent for the sake of being violent are they just evil people? The, the reason that I frankly think it's a waste of time to engage in moral value judgments about uh, people's violence is because it doesn't advance by one iota our understanding of either the causes or the prevention of the violent behavior. People sometimes ask if I believe in forgiving criminals. My answer to that is no, I don't believe in forgiveness any more than I believe in condemnation. It's only if we as a society can take the same attitude of treating violence as a problem in public health and preventive medicine rather than as a moral evil. Uh, it's only when we make that change in our own attitudes and assumptions and values that we will actually succeed in reducing the level of violence rather than stimulating it, which is what we do now. The more justice you seek, the more hurt you become because there's no thing as justice. There is whatever there is out there. That's it. In other words, if people are conditioned to be racist and bigots, if they're brought up in an environment that advocates that, why do you blame the person for it? They're a victim 
of a subculture. Therefore, they have to be helped. The point is, we have to redesign the environment that produces aberrant behavior. That's the problem, not putting a person in jail. That's why judges, lawyers, freedom of choice, such concepts are dangerous because it gives you misinformation that the person is bad or that person is a serial killer. Serial killers are made just like soldiers become serial killers with a machine gun. They become killing machines, but nobody looks at them as murderers or assassins because that's natural. So we blame people. We say, well, this guy was a Nazi. He tortured Jews. No, he was brought up to torture Jews. Once you accept the fact that people have individual choices and they're free to make those choices, free to make choices means without being influenced. And I can't understand that at all. All of us are influenced in all our choices by the culture we live in, by our parents and by the values that dominate. So we're influenced. So there can't be free choices. What's the greatest country in the world? The true answer, I haven't been all over the world and I don't know, know enough about different cultures to answer that question. I don't know anybody that speaks that way. I say, it's good old USA, it's the greatest country in the world. There's no survey, have you been to India? No. Have you been to England? No. Have you been to France? No. Well, what do you make your assumptions on? They can't answer, they get mad at you. They say, well, God damn it, who the hell are you to tell me what to think? You know, don't forget, you're dealing with aberrated people. They're not responsible for their answers. They're victims of culture. That means they've been influenced by their culture.